It's another edition of Time About the Movies. We're jumping into a brand new year with January 2nd, 1998. And we're starting off with the first of two weeks worth of 1997 leftovers. I'll delve into that at the end of the video, but um, we still have a couple movies from Christmas weekend that we haven't gotten to look at yet. Five in particular, and then two that came out this weekend. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right to, on into it. we got a lot to cover, and we'll start off with the first movie that we have on the list here, and that is Mavi and Rose. Of course, Mavi and Rose translates from uh, French Belgian to English to My Life in Pink, and that's pretty much what the story is. Um, you basically have a transgender girl, and her and it depicts her family and community struggling to accept her gender identity. And um, yeah, talk about a movie that's ahead of its time. And not only that, talking about a, t a young girl like this is a young person that is dealing with this. Um, uh, he was raised. This this, kid, uh, this person was raised as a boy, and he wants to li he, he wants to live as a girl. And you know, this movie um, I've never seen it before, but I gotta say, looking at a little bit of the plot here, uh, we're dealing with some stuff here that is very interesting stuff here. I mean, uh, I'm looking at something that happens in the plot here, and this kid attempts suicide at one point because. Of what because of what of the situation in here and this is some pretty deep stuff here and um, I don't know I've never seen this movie but I'm kind of curious to see how this actually plays out it has got some good reviews it won the gold it was a Golden Globe nominee for best foreign language film and I think it won it was up for the Oscar for the Belgian entry for the best foreign language film of the Oscars but was not accepted as a nomination but um like I said this looks like a movie that's pretty that's pretty well ahead of its time and a film that maybe just maybe could be something pretty interesting thing and pretty unique and um i don't know i'm kind of curious to check it out at some point but um like i said i haven't seen it before but i'm definitely my interest is definitely peaked on this film like i said i think it's a movie that's very much ahead of its time and i think came out way before it had a chance to really show like if this was released today i think this would have gotten a much better much bigger response to, than what it would have gotten back then because I think this one's largely forgotten but then again I don't really know too much about this movie other than what I'm seeing here from the trailer but like I said it looks like it could be very interesting so so yeah that's Mavi and Rose aka My Life in Pink so let's go ahead and move on to Martin Scorsese's latest film or as I'd like to call it a rip is Diet the Last Emperor uh, this is Cundin I mean, just by that trailer alone, you can definitely tell that Disney was trying to do something similar to The Last Emperor, which came out 10 years prior, and was a much better movie in comparison. But um, the story behind this movie is more interesting than what's going on behind the scenes. This was the second film released in 1997 to cover uh, the depiction of the Dalai Lama. We already talked about the other one, Seven Years in Tibet. But this one covers a period three times longer, and it's actually the last film penned by... Uh, Melissa Matheson, who wrote E.T. and would later write the BFG, this was the last song she wrote before her death in, I think it was 2015 that happened? Let me just double check here. Yeah, 2015 is when that happened, so the BFG was technically her last movie, but this was the last movie she made when she was still alive, and the film, like I said, garnered some controversy before its release. 
So what happened was the leaders of China were very objective to what Disney was planning to do by distributing the film. They even threatened to pre prevent Disney from having future access to China as a market. And, um, you know, Disney steadfast stood in st stark contrast to Universal Pictures, who had earlier turned down the chance to distribute Kundin for fear of upsetting the Chinese. So they had Scorsese, Matheson, and several other members of the production banned from the Chinese government from ever entering China as a result of making the film. And China also retaliated by banning Disney films and pulling the, tele the Disney cartoons they had on there. And then the following year, they apologized for releasing the film and began to undo the damage, eventually leading to Shanghai Disneyland opening almost 20 years later in 2016. And Michael Eisner had apologized for offending Ch Chinese sensitivities, calling the film a stupid mistake, We're going on to say that the bad news is that the film was made, the good news is that nobody watched it. Here I want to apologize, and in the future we should prevent this sort of thing, which insults our friends, from happening. And by 2015, Scorsese's ban had been lifted as he attended the premiere of the audition in Maku. And despite this never being released on streaming, this has been released on DVD and Blu-ray by Kino Lobo. In fact, it got so bad, that Disney basically buried this film, which was limited to release the, limited the release because of what, minimizing the damage to the relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, which only ended, this, ended up with this movie making $6 million in the process. This is a film that cost $28 million, and it only brought in $6 million. And um, it did get nominations for Academy Awards, but like I said, man, this is a film that just feels like a diet version of The Last Emperor. Like Disney wanted to make their own version of The Last Emperor, which is a far superior movie. It's a much more engaging film. And while this film has some striking visuals to it, the story itself really isn't all that interesting. It's not an intriguing film. It's not that engaging of a movie. It's not the worst movie you can make about this, but... At the same time, there's no real pizzazz to it. There's nothing about it that really makes you say, this is something that needed to be made. This feels like a film that um, Martin Scorsese was trying to do so he can get his long-deserved Oscar, which he wouldn't get for another 10 years with a much better film with The, with the Departed. But with this, the film itself is just... It's just not even worth it. It's not a film that's engaging. It's not a film that's exciting. It basically, like I said, tries to rip off The Last Emperor, but The Last Emperor did it a whole lot better because they had a more engaging story, more engaging characters, and they kept you invested throughout the entire majority of the film. This film just feels like something that was just a throwaway, and when you spend, tw when you spend nearly $30 million on a film like this, you don't want to waste that money, and you definitely feel like they wasted a lot of money here for something that they had a lot of high hopes for, but just did not go that way whatsoever. It's a film that's largely been forgotten. It's largely seen as one of Martin Scorsese's least and his most unsuccessful movies, and you can definitely see why it was. It's not a bad movie per se. He's made a lot worse than this, but at the same time, it's nothing that great either. It's a film that's just largely forgettable. And um, you can honestly, can't, honestly, I don't see how you cannot see that. So, so that is Cundin. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is Afterglow. So you basically have two families who are unhappy with their respective relationships. First of an ambitious businessman and a sexually frustrated wife. And a second of a repair contractor and a former B-movie actress. And when this guy arrives to the other guy's apartment to make some minor repairs and Marion becomes obsessed with him, the everyday balance breaks. So basically you have these two people sw uh, switching couples, really. And, um, I don't know, it doesn't really feel sound like something that could be that interesting. Unless you had somebody like a Woody Allen or somebody like Alan Rudolph who directed this. Um... It's got a good cast to it. Nick Nolte, Julie Christie, Laura Flynn Boyle, Johnny Lee Miller. Some decent actors in here, and it doesn't look like it's a bad movie per se, but it feels like a film that's kind of a one-note premise. Like, it doesn't really feel like it has a whole lot there to work with here, but it's got some decent reviews to it. In fact, Julie Christie got nominated for an Oscar for this performance in this film. Um, but yeah, other than that, though, I don't think there's anything about this movie that I really want to see about it. Like, I, don't, I haven't seen this movie, so I don't really know if it's any good or not, but... Uh... I don't know. Maybe it is actually. Maybe it is actually worth something. But to me personally, I just don't see it right, right in front of me. So I don't know if it's any good or not. Maybe one day I'll definitely check it out. But uh, that's Afterglow. Let's move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is uh, directed by Alan Rickman, The Winter Guest with Emma Thompson and her real life mother. Once before, I've seen the sea frozen, just the once, long, long ago. <laughs> All Francis wanted was to hide from the world. Francis! Until her mother arrived. What have you done to her? Here, cut her. That's plain to see. My grandmother's a milk. Doesn't make you look any younger. Say something nice, mother. Try. 
It's a bloody battlefield. A happy woman doesn't mutilate herself. I have to think I look good. I've seen you look better on <laughs> Take my bloody arm, mother. I don't need you now. Take my arm. Please. So the story of this takes place on a wintry day, one wintry day in Scotland, and the film focuses on several different people. You have a mother and daughter, uh, Emma Thompson and a real-life mother, Felita Law, two young boys skipping school, Douglas Murphy and Sean Biggerstaff, two old women who frequently attend strangers' funerals, Sandra Vaux and Sheila Reed, and two teenagers, Arlene Cockburn and Gary Hollywood. Uh, basically, it consists of pro the interactions between the characters, and I don't really know too much more about this one because I've never seen it before. Uh, I know Alan Rickman directed it, which is very interesting, because I don't think he ever directed another movie before this one. Let me see here. He would direct one other movie, uh, A Little Chaos, that came out 17 years after this film, so he has directed another movie since then. Um, yeah, as far as the movie itself goes, I don't really know too much about it. I don't know if it's any good or not, but... Um, it could be. It's got some good reviews, a lot of praise for Emma Thompson's performance. It's Emma Thompson. She doesn't usually pick bad movies and usually when she does she's not the work she doesn't really give a bad performance so i doubt that this is a bad movie i think this could be actually something kind of decent so but other than that though i don't really know too much about it it came out this weekend so might as well cover it here so that's the winter guests let's move on to the, the next one we have here and that is the education of little tree cherokee lived in these hills since the creator put them there. They farm the valleys, taught they sell the way. And that's you, little tree. That's where you come from. Written and directed by the same guy that gave us A River Runs Through It, the writer of that. Uh, this is basically a story where you have an orphan boy raised by his paternal Scottish descendant grandfather and his Cherokee grandmother in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, as far as the film itself goes, it's another one I don't really know too much about, except that James Cromwell's in here, and that's Graham Greene playing his grandfather. And uh, other than that, though, I don't really know too much else about the movie. I don't know if it's any good or not. It's got mixed reviews on there, so it could be decent. But again, I haven't seen it. It feels like this movie was supposed to be Paramount's big prestige Oscar film and not something like Titanic because it came out just a couple of days after that and kind of crashed and burned at the box office and was not a big critical hit. So I don't know how well that went. But other than that, though, like I said, I don't really know if it's any good or not. I'm probably guessing it probably is at least tolerable. It doesn't look like it's a bad movie per se, but that's really all I'm going off on on that one, so um, not much more I can say about that one. The Education of Little Tree. Uh, on to the next movie, and that is Daniel Day-Lewis and Emily Watson in The Boxer. Man of honor. Don't blend out. A woman of courage. People are separated by fate. Fate So this is uh, the third time that Jim Sheridan and Daniel Day-Lewis have made a movie together. Of course, they follow in the name of the father as well as um, My Left Foot. And uh, you have Daniel Day-Lewis who plays a former boxer and a professional IRA volunteer who is trying to go straight after his release from prison and meets various people including Brian Cox who plays a character in here, Emily Watson. And it kind of looks like the Scottish equivalent to, no, Irish equivalent to Rocky. Scottish because we've already looked at two movies that are set in, in Scotland, but um, it looks pretty generic, but, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis usually will never turn down, turn in a bad performance and, you, and usually will give it his all. Uh, Emily Watson's a great actress. Brian Cox is always great. Um, uh, as far as the film itself goes, it's it's tolerable. It's fine for what it is. It's a one-time watch. It's not something you'd, I feel like you need to watch over and over again. It's definitely not one of the stronger Daniel Day-Lewis films, especially when you consider some of the other films he's made. My Left Foot, There Will Be Blood, Lincoln. Uh, they're not even the best movie directed by Jim Sheridan, who's made a lot better movies than this. But um, other than that, though, there's not really too much more to say about it. It's a decent film. Good for a one-time watch. I probably won't ever watch it again, honestly. So... So that's The Boxer. Let's go ahead and move on to the last one we have here, and that is Oscar and Lucinda. Born worlds apart, 
Oscar and Lucinda were destined for each other. Are you curious? Of course I am curious. A game of chance brought them together. Heads. But the greatest risk they'd ever take could tear them apart. I Fox Searchlight Pictures proudly presents Rafe Fiennes. Shall we play? And Kate Blanchett. Yes. Oscar and Lucinda, a film by Jillian Armstrong. So this is Jillian Armstrong's follow-up to Little Women. It follows Oscar, played by Ray Fiennes. He's a young, angelic, he's Angl Anglican priest. I think I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I'm sorry. Anglican priest. I think that's what it is. But uh, he's a misfit. He's an outcast with the soul of an angel. As a boy, even though he's a strict Pente Pentecostal family, uh, he felt God told him through a sign to leave his father in faith to join the Church of England. And Lucinda, played by Kate Blanchett, is a teenage Australian heiress who has an almost desperate desire to liberate her sex from the confines of the male-dominant culture of the Australia of that time. She buys a glass factory, has a dream of building a church made of almost entirely of glass, and then transports it to Belgian, a remote settlement on the north coast. And these two meet up on a ship going to Australia. Once there, they are, for different reasons, ostracized from society. They join forces together. They both become passionate gamblers. And Lucinda bets Oscar's entire inheritance that he cannot transport the glass church to the outback safely. And Oscar accepts his wager, and this leads to the events that will change both of their lives forever. I read that off of Wikipedia because I have never seen this film. But it's Ray Fiennes, it's um, Kate Blanchett, it's got Kieran Hines, Tom Wilkinson, Richard Roxborough. A great cast overall. Jeffrey Rush narrates it. So, it's got to be at least tolerable with, that, with all those names on board. I've not heard anything that says it's a bad movie, so... I'm guessing it's not a bad movie, but it, then again, I don't really know too much about it. I've never seen it before. I don't know if it's any good or not, but it can't be that bad of a movie with the talent that they have on there. One would think it wouldn't be, so it doesn't look bad either. It's got a nice visual flow to it, and it has a nice story to it, so uh, you know, maybe it could be good. But other than that, I'm not really sure if it's any good or not, so uh, that's pretty much all I got from that one. That's Oscar and Lucinda. So with that said, that wraps up another edition of Time About the Movies. When we meet next time, uh, we'll have one movie to look at that came, came out that weekend, Firestorm, starring Oakland Raiders defensive end, former de defensive end, Howie Long, and probably the only leading role that ever made it to theaters. And um, let's just say that this is a reason why January exists. But in addition to that, we'll look at some 1997 leftovers. I have a list right here of some films that I didn't get to cover, including a couple of mostly directed video titles, but notable directed video titles from Disney. Uh, including Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin, Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, which actually did get a theatrical release in Canada. So that, those are four of them we'll cover. We'll also cover Female Perversions and also Best Men. So seven movies again to look at next time, and we'll definitely delve into those on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, Please hit the place on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I will see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Oh, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this. So with that said, I'm out. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.